Hello lovely people, welcome to the Geek Cover. I am Penj and welcome back to Crusader Kings 3 where we rejoin Earl Walthy of Sureton of Northamptonshire and also we rejoin Countess Umgard, his wife and soulmate because yes indeed, last time out they became soulmates which is all very lovely indeed. So they've all got romantic and lovied up which is great and you know, who wouldn't want a soulmate? in the time that they live in. In this particular world of, you know, there's intrigue and plotting and murders and war and plague and all that kind of stuff, it must be really nice to have a soulmate. So, well done you two. I am very pleased for you. So, yeah, last time we embarked on a romance scheme upon Ermgard, upon our own wife, and the game got a little bit confused because I think you're supposed to use the romance schemes on people that maybe you would like to maybe marry in the future, not somebody that you're already married to and you've had a number of children with. So, some of the things that came up in the actual sort of romance storyline were a little bit strange. One of them was saying, ah, yes, uh, Countess Ermgard's husband has proposed a hunt and you think you should go. And it's a bit, no, but we are Countess Ermgard's husband. What's going on there? I don't really understand. So I think we confused the game a little bit, but it was fine. And I really enjoyed the romance sort of little storyline thing that popped up. Uh, one of the things we had to do was potentially starve ourselves because we should be able to feed ourselves on the love for her. But of course, we didn't do that because we're deceitful. So we tried to kind of sneak around it. It didn't work. She caught us. But it didn't matter in the end. So we went on a hunt. That was the final sort of thing. Went on a bit of a hunt and she got cornered by an angry, hungry wolf. And we came in like the bold, noble hero that we are. And we shot the wolf with our bow and arrow. And then we went and got her and we saved her. And yeah, we probably just had a little hug at that point. We held hands. We skipped through the forest and it was all very splendid. And it's given us this great, big, gigantic opinion boost. Soulmate gives you a 120 opinion modifier, which is just crazy. It's just huge. It's just a huge modifier, particularly when you sort of note that it caps out at plus 100. So you've got a little room there. If you were just a soulmate and that was it with somebody else, you could then have some room for some bad things and they would forgive you. They'd actually just sort of let you off having a few sort of negative modifiers because that plus 120 is just so high. And then when you combine it with all the other stuff, so you've got a spouse and forgiving and grateful and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's not going to really dip really, is it? We're going to see that at plus 100 for quite some time, which is very good because, you know, that's our wife. And now, yeah, they're in this together now, which is lovely. However... With one hand it gives, with another hand it takes away. So yes, we might have made a soulmate, but last time we did lose our one and only friend. If we go here and look, we lost our friend Maraduth. It was very sad. It was very unexpected as well. He died of pneumonia, which was just very, very sudden. It just sort of popped up in the middle of the screen and it said something like, oh no, the memories will remain. And we had a little bit of a cry about it. It was like, oh Maradoth, please, but I will be strong for you, but I don't know where to go. Now you've gone and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so yes, we made a soulmate, but we lost our friend, which is very sad. However, bringing it back to good news, we did welcome Christina Cupboard to the world and she is very impressive indeed because if you look here, her trait here, her physical trait is that she is Amazonian. So she gets a plus eight boost to her prowess. She has a massive health boost and she's very attractive because she's powerful, healthy and strong. She has a sublime female physique. That is going to be wonderful. That is going to be brilliant. So we can, if we can work this, we can have like a family of Amazonian and Northamptonian people, which is just going to be brilliant. That's going to be very good. So well done, Christina. Well done for being born with such a wonderful physical trait. Good job. Also, toward the end of the previous part, we did see the implications of our dear friend Maradoth's death and it involved the changing of ownership of land quite a few times in relatively quick succession. And it was very interesting to watch. So when Maradoth died, he passed everything on to this chappy here. This is Gruffith Ap Maradoth possibly. I might be saying that wrong. I'm not entirely sure. Does an F and an F in Welsh become something else? Because the D and the D becomes a THUH. So I don't know what the F and the F becomes, but we'll call him Gruffith for now. So Gruffith Ap Maradoth, he inherited an awful lot of stuff. In fact, if we go and look there, he inherited everything that's lit up there. So all of Northern England, most of the Midlands, all of Wales. It's a lot of territory for an 11-year-old to look after. And it included all our lands as well, because he was our liege. But we were fine with it. I wasn't really overly bothered. It was a bit, yeah, okay, fine. He can be our liege. That's great. Hello, how are you? However, the chappy down here in the southwest of Wales, he was not such a fan of Gruffith there. Lord Owen, who is the grand old age of 12, decided to declare war upon Gruffith, who's the grand old age of 11, 
because he didn't like him very much. Now, Griffith hadn't been in the job very long. He was still sort of, you know, mourning the death of his dad. But this chappy here, he decided to seize the moment. And yeah, he declared war on sort of the tyranny of Duke Griffith or something like that, which, yeah, a bit harsh. Um, but he won. He did come and ask us if he wanted to join, actually, but we politely declined. But it didn't really matter because, yes, he won. So he beat Griffith, and that meant that Griffith, if we actually get back to Griffith, he then lost everything. He was stripped of all of his titles. So as you can see now, he is entirely unlanded. He's got nothing. He has not one bit of land to his name. It's got all those claims, because he did have them, and they're kind of, you know, still rightfully his by his sort of, yeah, by his birthright and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but yeah, he doesn't have them. And they've all passed over to his younger brother, Duke Gluithian, possibly, uh, Ap Maradoth, who is five years old. So now his five-year-old brother has inherited all of that stuff. I mean, if it was a lot of land to look after for an 11-year-old, that is an immeasurable amount of land to look after for someone who's five. Also, the name of the land changed as well, didn't it? So beforehand, it was always Brainiac. It came up in big letters as Brainiac, and Brainiac was the sort of the main sort of name of these lands up here. But uh, now it's called Dehubath, and I was wondering why that was last time out. I was a bit, why has the name changed? And people in the comments have pointed out that it's just the uh, the name of the primary title. So previously, Maradoth and indeed Gruffith, their primary title was the Duchy of Brainiac, which is the one that we feel like we should have a claim to as well, because that should be our land's really. Um, and then this chappy here, well, I say chappy, this whatever five-year-old, this young boy, uh, his primary title is the Duchy of de Hubarth, which ironically is the one down there. It's the one in the south of Wales, which is where the initial attack came from that deposed your brother. So that's quite interesting. So now your primary title is the place, the sort of the, uh, the duchy of the place that removed your brother from power and put you in power. Oh, that's quite interesting. Was that arranged? Was that was that some sort of prior agreement? I do not know. But there we go. So that's why it's changed its name. So he still holds the same amount of lands and territory and all that kind of stuff. It's just which one your primary title is that actually sort of influences the name that appears on the map in gigantic big letters. However, we do have a bit of an issue in that young Duke Gluithian there, so our five-year-old liege, has decided to set up home in Nottingham which is unfortunate for us because we want to get our hands on the Duchy of Mercia. We want to become a Duke. We want to become the Duke of Mercia itself. And to do that, we need to try and claim as many lands in that place as we can. We've got quite a lot of them, obviously, but we need Worcestershire and Herefordshire under our control. And then also possibly Nottinghamshire. But yeah, he set up shop there. That is kind of his place. He set that up as his kind of, you know, administrative capital or whatever. And that means that he is looking after Nottinghamshire. So if we want to get our hands on that, we're going to have to go to war with this five-year-old child who's got quite a lot of troops. He's got more military strength than us, which is very unfortunate indeed. So that could be a bit of a problem, but we do need to become a duke. That's desperately what we need to do now because we're not getting any younger. Old Walthoff, he's not old. He's not old by any account. He's 35. But let's just remember, let's have a little remember of, uh, well, was he in relationships? No. Let's remember Maradoth. How old was Maradoth when he died? Hang on. He was, he was 31. So he was significantly younger than us when he died of pneumonia. So it could happen to us at any point. So we really, really do need to get our hands on a dukedom in order to ensure that our lands are not kind of all fragmented if we suddenly died and everything gets shared between the two boys, between T and Bernard. So yeah, we really do need to get a duke title under our belt. And this looks like the best one. It looks like a sort of a solid option. We own quite a lot of the land for it. But yeah, we just need to actually get that underway. So there are a few things that we can do with that, which we will look at at some point in the near future. There is one tiny little thing we need to look at just before we get things underway, and that's down here, and it's what we're going to be researching, because we are currently the head of the Anglo-Saxon culture group. We have more counties under our control that are Anglo-Saxon than anybody else, which means we can choose what we would like to research, which is all very good. However, everything takes a very long time. If we were to look at battlements, for example, that's going to be discovered in 325 years. Now we could change over to look at that, which would bring it down to 31 years if we actually focus on it, rather than just sort of gaining it from, you know, just sort of general sort of chitter chatter about battlements. We go and actually really focus on battlements. It brings it down to 31 years. I'm not gonna leave it on battlements. So previously it was on this thing here. 
armillary sphere, which is something to do with boats. We're not bothered about boating. None of our territories actually sort of make any contact with the sea. They're all landlocked. So yeah, we don't do much in the way of boating. So I'm not really bothered about that. The thing that I would like to get back under our control and back sort of learning is horseshoes. Because we have set this before. We were the head of the Anglo-Saxon culture at some point, And then it got taken away from us. And whoever actually took over changed it back to these weird kind of sphere things. So let's put it back on horseshoes. So there we go. In 10 years time, we're going to discover horseshoes. <laughs> I mean, it just seems a long time to sort of, you know, work out what horseshoes are. I just like the idea of someone sort of looking at a horse's foot and looking at a, sh a bit of metal that's the shape of a horse's foot and just staring at them for 10 years going, if only there was some way we could combine these two things. And eventually they just sort of put one on the other and go, oh, right, well, there we go. How long did it take? Oh, 10 years. Wonderful. So uh, there we go. We'll go back onto the uh, horseshoes because that increases our movement speed by 10% which is no bad thing. We can move our troops around 10% quicker. We can get around everywhere 10% faster than people who do not have horseshoes. So yes, we will leave it on there, please. And hopefully nobody can take that away from us. Nobody's going to steal our head of that culture group anymore. And we can get horseshoes researched. Actually, I just remembered one more thing that we need to look at. So Reeve Edmund here, he thinks he should be on the council. He considers himself to be a powerful vassal. He looks after Rutland. So let's have a look. Can he actually go on to the council in any way, shape or form? Because at the moment, he's very grumpy. He loses 40 opinion of us because he thinks he should be on the council and he is not. So he's got quite a bit of diplomacy. That is better, I think, than our chancellor at the moment. Yeah, he's got 13 so we could get another three points of diplomacy. And um, Donald is, yes, he's our relative. He's our half-brother. But I'm not that bothered. I'm not too fussed. I think we change him round and get you in. Oh, my goodness me. You're very good. Oh, you're really good. You've got 18. But you're not an important vassal. You're not powerful. Um, let's get him in just to keep him happy. Because he might get sort of sinister ideas if, he, if that continues to sort of plummet. If his opinion of us gets lower and lower, he might get, you know, slightly murderous ambitions. So let's actually appoint him to the council. Donald gets a bit grumpy with us for a while. That's absolutely fine. And there he is. And his opinion goes immediately back up to plus 44. So there we go. That will keep him off our back for a little while. Joe, our council is pretty good. Looking at our council, it's very impressive. The uh, sort of bishop's got 15, the chancellor's got 16, the steward's got 16, marshal of 18, and the spymaster. Of course, the wonderful spymaster with, with 26 intrigue. So yeah, our council is actually very, very good. So with that sorted, I think we now move time on. And at the moment, I think we might need to go through a little period of sort of building up some sort of uh, infrastructure around the place. So maybe we build ourselves some more farm fields and all that kind of stuff. Reeve Eadman gained the trait Aspiring Blade Master. Your marshals... Oh, hang on. Reed Eadman's the guy we just got. Oh, crikey. What's Aspiring Blade Master do? Prowess plus three. And he gets a tiny boost to his disease resistance. Um, okay. His prowess is now five. I mean, yeah, I'm not going to send him into battle. I'm not going to send him charging into combat because he's not that good. I mean, I mean, if we look at that, his prowess is five. <laughs> I mean, our two-year-old Amazonian daughter has got a prowess of eight. So I don't think we should be sending him into battles, but okay, that's lovely. Well done. Um, so yeah, I think we need to build some bits and bobs around here. So we'll build some fields and stuff. I like that of getting fields in. I want a strong economy and you get fields and they get you extra food later on and bring the money in. So yeah, if we go to here, this, uh, this place. Oh, hello to my vassal. As an influential earl, it's only fair you have a voice on my council. Um, ah, he wants me to become the steward. Okie doke. Let's go and have a look at what that actually entails on the liege's council. We're the steward. Okay, yeah, that's pretty good. So we get ourselves an extra one gold per month from just being on his council. Oh, that's very good. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. That's very, very lovely. Good job. Thank you. Um, so yeah, let's get ourselves some fields constructed. Um, so yeah, this place is generating less than one tax per month. So yeah, Northampton's getting loads. So it'd be nice if we could bump all the places up so they're earning at least over one gold per month in tax. That'd be nice. So let's get this done here. Farms and fields. Absolutely. 135. We have 174. Get that constructed. Thank you very much. And at some point in the future, we might start upgrading them as well for a little bit more money. But, um, but yeah, initially, we'll just try and get every place just generating a tiny bit more tax. Just thinking, we've got no personal schemes going on right now, and we can go and befriend people. Is it worth befriending 
our spy master. Is it worth befriending Theo Delinda so she's slightly less inclined to maybe kill us in our sleep? Because she's the spy master. She goes round, she's creepy, she's sneaky, she gets all the secrets, but she's also got this intrigue of 26, which means she's very good at doing that, which means she might possibly get it into her head that she could kill us and put somebody else into power that she prefers, you know, more than us. So maybe if we become her friend, that might reduce that risk. And we're not doing anything else. We've got no other kind of schemes going on. So why don't we have a go and see if we can befriend you? So let's not pick seduce or romance. That would be bad. Let's see if we can befriend Theoda Linda and just become her buddy. So 58%. That's not brilliant. But okay, we'll give it a go. Because yeah, we're not doing any other schemes. So we might as well use this time to do a scheme of some sort and see if it works. Oh, I know what we haven't done, and we possibly do need to look at it sooner rather than later, because it could come in quite handy if we want to get ourselves this duchy title. And we might need to look at getting some marriages sorted for the kids in order to secure some alliances, because, yeah, we've not got round to it yet. So, yes, we have the four children, and, of course, we're going to be playing as T at some point in the future. Well, maybe, if he survives. Um, so, yeah, we want to make sure that we have some good alliances and stuff with marrying off the children. So let's have a look. So Clara... Clara, oh, I kind of, do we want to marry Christina away? I want to get, can we find somebody that will happily marry, but then have a matrilineal marriage so all the kids can be brought into our house? Because I want all the Amazonian kids to belong to us and not somebody else. That would be wonderful. If we could sort that, that would be absolutely grand. Um, Let's go and have a little look at who we can get an alliance with. I mean, I'd be happy with, I don't want anybody from sort of around here because that could, could cause problems. Yeah, but maybe Ireland? Maybe Ireland could be good for some, some alliances because they're not that far away. Or, you know, over here, I'm not too bothered. Maybe over in, is that Brittany? Yeah, so Brittany or the north of France, whatever. It'd be just really good if we could get some alliances sorted. So let's go and have a little look. So here we go. Christina, can we get ourselves, if we're going to here and put alliances on. So, right, anybody that can give us an alliance and order it by alliance power. Um... Okay, so the strongest alliance would be a peasant revolt. I don't think we're going to go down that route because you'll be crushed sooner rather than later. Um, okay, right, who else is there? Let's have a quick look through. Oh, this is interesting. This is very interesting indeed. There are an awful lot of children of the petty kingdom of Munster. Okay, hang on a minute. Move that out of the way. Where's where's Munster? Whereabouts is the petty kingdom of Munster? Oh, that is that is a big block of territory. Oh, yes, you're probably very good indeed. Okay, right, so where are we? So you're down here. <laughs> it's like the Weasleys. Um, okay, so what do they actually got? Uh, if we go to your liege, 1,268 troops that they can just send in. That is very good. I mean, yes, it's inferior to ours. We've got you know, quite a large amount of troops, but that is 1,200 people. And they've got some war machines. They've got some pikemen. They've got 500 light footmen. That is very, very good. So yeah, the, the number of troops is not just all levies. They've got some proper actual, proper men-at-arms, you know, official military units there. Yeah, that's very good. Can we go and marry into that? That would be wonderful. Now, yeah, this is this is uh, our lovely Christina, who we do want to... If we could keep her kids on our side of the marriage, that would be great. That would be wonderful. If you can have the kids into our house so we can have a load of Amazonian kids, that would be splendid. Um, How old are you? You're three now. Oh, that's lovely. There is somebody here. There's loads of kids. There's loads of them. There's four of those kids. Five. Oh, are all of his kids unmarried? There's quite a lot of them. Plus himself as well. Plus the actual king. I, I'd rather... Maybe not him. <laughs> I mean, not the king. But how about you? About Ferdomnak MacMurkad. Um, because you've got a trait. You've got a physical trait. Will you go for that? So there you go. So inheritable traits. If those two were to have kids, they could be Amazonian comely people or comely i don't know how you pronounce that word so this gives them a massive load of physical attraction attraction opinion plus 15 that gives them another plus 10 and extra fertility so they would be really really very attractive very reproductive amazonians which is brilliant however can we do a matrilineal marriage i imagine not yes we can yes we can children of this marriage will be born into house cupboard <gasps> this is wonderful Oh, this is brilliant. Okay, so I think he's got so many kids. He's just like, look, I, I just want to marry them off for an alliance, please. I don't care where the kids go. I've got probably got loads of grandkids anyway. I don't know what's going on. So, yeah, absolutely. Should we do that? Let's get you married to whatever it's called, Ferdomnak. Because, yeah, you've got some good traits that the children might get. Oh, that's brilliant. 
That is brilliant. So yeah, you can both get betrothed. And yeah, you won't have to wait too long. There's only a three years sort of difference. Yeah, okay. Send that proposal. Is that going to work? Are we going to have an alliance with Munster? Yes. I gladly accept your betrothal proposition. Your daughter Christina will be betrothed to my son, Fadomnak. Oh, that is wonderful. Okay, and now if we look in here, we have ourselves our very first ally. We are allied to Petty King Merchad MacDonchad of Munster. That is very exciting indeed. Right, we've got an ally, everybody. We've got a military buddy. Hurrah! Somebody in the comments as well had a very, very wonderful idea indeed. And that was to marry Gruffith, the chap who did have all those claims, but who then got deposed. Because he's got loads of claims under his belt. So if we marry him and bring him into our court... That could mean that we will have all those claims available to us. And then if we make him a vassal of some sort, if we ever become a duke, then yes, he will have claims on all these lands, which could be very helpful indeed. So can we arrange a marriage with you? It would have to be to Clara, but I'm okay with that. I'm fine with that. So if we do that, he's not going to accept. Okay, Duke Lewithian is marrying down. Okay, right, yeah, so that's his... So his... <laughs> So his love life, this 11-year-old's love life, is being managed by his five-year-old brother. Okay. Oh, no, he's six now. Oh, happy birthday, my, my liege. Um, yeah, that's that's not good, is it? Yeah, we can't do that, and we definitely can't do a matrilinear one. However, however, if we were to become a duke, that might not be an issue. Or if he liked us a bit more, that might not be an issue. Because, yeah, it's only minus 31. I mean, it, yeah, it's a little bit distant, but it's not too far away. It's not like it's minus 1,000 or anything. So it's something that we could try and work on. Okay, that's interesting. But yeah, we need to get there sooner rather than later because somebody else might have the same idea and somebody else might see this very, very lovely big pile of claims he's got and try and get them for themselves. So yeah, we might need to do that sooner rather than later. But yes, that's a very good idea, comment section. We'll maybe give that a go when we become a duke, if we become a duke, if that ever happens. Okay, hang on a minute. Something weird just happened there. All of England has gone dark. So that was once lit up. We could see into this. That's all now gone a bit dark. And something has appeared over here. What is this? The Kingdom of Wales. What? Was there a Kingdom of Wales? Has there always been a Kingdom of Wales? Hang on, if we click, if we look at that. Uh, that's, okay, Wales is massive. Why is there Wales? Why does Wales suddenly exist? When, when did this happen? What's happening here? Something strange has gone on. So, hang on a minute. Who's our... Who's our liege? Uh, hang on, right, hang on. Let's just check. There's us. There's our liege. So our liege is still little six-year-old Duke Gluithian. But now his liege is King Richard of Wales. Okay. Well, where did you appear from? Have you always been there? Um, who are your parents? Your parents are King... W the king is dead. The king is dead. That's King William. King William of England is dead and it looks like his country is fractured in two. Okay, this is fascinating. How did he die? Died from his wounds. Oh, I mean, yes, he was quite poorly, wasn't he? He was injured and only had one eye and stuff, but oh, oh my goodness me. The king is dead. When did that happen? 18th of May. Oh yes, and not long ago. Yes, it's only just happened. And now England has kind of fragmented in two with Wales looking like it takes the, the better part of the land there. Okay, so who's now, who's the king of England? King Robert Curthose of England. Or Curthose? Curthose? Uh, Curthose? I don't know how you pronounce that either. Okay. So you are... You look after the Kingdom of England and own oh, the Normandy bit. It's okay. The bit across the across the channel. And then East Anglia. Yeah, you've got various other little sort of bits and bobs. Earldoms and what have you. And you've got a claim to the Kingdom of Wales. Okay, I'm not entirely sure. How did the Kingdom of Wales appear? Was that always a thing that was going to appear? I don't know how that's kind of springing to existence. I, I'm not sure there was a Kingdom of Wales before. Did it get created? Is that how the succession thing works? So you there, Robert took the main title, which was the Kingdom of England, which is fine. But then what happened with the other one? Hang on a minute. Hang on. Hang on. Where's the where's the succession shenanigans stuff? Where's that? It must be in here somewhere. Where is it? Oh, I see what's happened here. Oh, this is very intriguing indeed. So it comes down to their succession law that they've actually got. So they've got this Confederate Partition Succession Law. We've got Partition, but they've got this first one here, which says, under Confederate Partition, your titles will be divided equally between your children. New titles may 
be created for younger heirs. And then further down, it says younger children will be given titles starting with those of the same rank as the primary title. And then younger children will have titles created for them if enough land is held. And I imagine the primary title was the Kingdom of England. So King Robert got that. It was like, yeah, absolutely. You are going to get this. You are the King of England. Well done. But then they went to their his younger brother, so King Richard, who is 30, 31, where Robert's 32. So he's a year younger. But then he said, well, hang on a minute. We've got this Confederate partition thing. I should be given a title starting with those of the same rank as the primary title. I want a kingdom, please. So then it's created the Kingdom of Wales. And that's what he's got. So yeah. This has been split in two, so the land that King William did have has been carved neatly in two, and we now have ourselves a bit of an England sort of an England Wales kind of thing going on. So, oh my goodness, I mean, Wales is huge. The land that Wales has got is absolutely massive. So yeah, King Richard came out of that. He came out of that very, very well indeed. And that also means that we do have a new ultimate liege. So our direct liege is the young Gluithian, but then yes, our top liege is King Richard of Wales. Okay. Well, hi, King Richard. How are you? I mean, at least you like us. You like us, which is okay. Your opinion of us is plus 23, helped by our huge illustrious bonus, which is enhanced by our lovely perk there. Um, also, he's terrified of us. He's terrified of us due to our dreadful reputation. Trembling before you, he will never oppose you directly. <gasps> okay, that's very, very good indeed. What is our, what is our dread, actually? 20. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. He, he's uh, hang on a minute. Does it say he's like easily scared or something? Because that's that's not very much. He's ambitious. He's oh, he's craven. Okay, yeah. So he's he's a little he's a little bit afraid of many things. He's afraid of uh, yeah, likely of dying in battle is less because he just runs away. I believe. Okay, right. Well, there we go. So the country is kind of fractured a bit. Everything's become a bit of a mess. Uh, okay, well, there we go. Interesting times here in England or Wales. Wherever we are, I don't know, but it's interesting. I think we should have a feast. It's been a little while since we had our last feast. You can only do it once every five years. So yeah, it's been over five years. I think it's time to have another feast, if only because it makes us lose 30 stress and we've got 75 stress right now. So that would be quite good. If we could bring that down to do, do, do math with pen 45, that would be very good indeed. So yeah, let's do that. It's only 50 gold. We've got 160. So yeah, Yes, let us send the invitations. We are hosting another famous feast in Northamptonshire. And there we go. A cheery gathering. Oh, it's it's absolutely wonderfully named. The guests are gathered in the Great Hall. Lords and ladies from the near and far reaches of the realm. The mood is bright and spirits are high as the feast begins. Welcome, friends. Look at my amazing hat. I can't remember if I had that hat on last time when we had a party. But Joe, you know what? If I did, then it's still wonderful. If not, come and marvel at the hat. Okay, the high table breaks. Oh dear. The great table seat in the upper nobility on the da dais, dais um, gave a loud crack, and a moment later it gave in under the weight of food and gilded decoration. As my most distinguished guest and I had to be fitted in among the lower nobility, I ended up close to my spy master, Theo de Linda. Okay, that could help with the friendship scheme we've got going on. As high nobles mingled with their lessers, words of both friendship and enmity were exchanged among people who rarely associate. Theodolinda and I ended up talking all evening and agreed it would be not the last time we feasted and laughed in each other's company. Oh, she's immediately become our friend. We don't have to go through the scheme for 13 months. It just happens right now. Oh, that is wonderful. Okay, we have ourselves a friend, which is very wonderful indeed. Okay, well, let's see what else happens from our wonderful, mighty feast. As my guests leave, they seem to depart in good spirits. I'm also relieved to see that Theodolinda does not part without saying farewell. We both know we will be seeing each other again soon. Well, yes, I work with her. I'll see her in court all the time. So, 30 opinion of us because we bonded at the feast. 20 opinion of us because we hosted a feast. So, she, what's her opinion of us anyway? Oh, it's plus 100 anyway. And we get 150 prestige. We get so much prestige anyway. But yeah, do you know what? More is lovely. And nothing bad happened at the feast. And it's brought our stress down. So there we go. A lovely feast. I'd, I'd like to think that we serve loads of tea. You know, it's just, it's it's like it's like an afternoon sort of tea. Tea, very small sandwiches with a crust cut off, all cut into triangles, and loads of cake. That's what we just did. It was a very, very lovely British tea cake feast. Okay, and our steward has finished increasing development in uh, in Huntingdonshire over there. So let's have a look. So what's the development of all our places? We wanted them all to be at least nine. I think they are all at least nine, which is wonderful. Okay, there we go. So we've increased development across all six of our counties that we own. That's pretty good. 
That's quite an impressive feat. Well done, steward. So let's get you back actually just uh, getting some money in now. You've done that. You've done that plenty. You've been around. You've been building bridges and sorting out roads and doing all that kind of stuff. So yeah, come back. Let's get some uh, Let's get some taxes done. You don't look very well, Reeve Wolf. Go and get some taxes in. Uh, yeah, do that. Uh, you look a bit unwell. Are, are you all right there? You're severely injured. Oh, okay. So your marshal's down, your intrigue is down, your prowess is down. Okay, yeah, you're, you're quite poorly. Okay, fine. Well, you just you just hang on in there. Hang on in there. You look a little bit beat up. I mean, maybe a wash? A wash might be quite nice. Just yeah, wash the blood off there. Just wash the blood off. Wash those cuts out. Make sure they're nice and clean. And, um, and uh, yeah, or I don't know, put on like a nice hood or a face mask or a really big hat. But yeah, can you not come to court like that, please? It's very distracting. And Reeve Arnsetel, who is our marshal, who is set to currently train our commanders, has had a nice side effect to the work he's doing, and he has improved our knight. So Hakon has increased his martial skill by one, which is good. So it's up to 16. So he is pretty good, even if he is also a bit injured. He is quite wounded, his poor Hakon. He looks a little bit beat up. Not as beat up as uh, our steward there. He's still a little bit hurt. But even so, even with his bit of, you know, his little injury, then, um, then yeah, he's still got quite good prowess. So that's pretty good. So well done. Yeah, that's good. I like that thing. I mean, yes, if we have a battle, if we go to war, then we'll switch over to organised levies because you get levy size up 23% and reinforcement rate up and all that kind of stuff. But right now, whilst we're not at war, it makes sense for us to just train our commanders. It brings our men at arms maintenance down. I mean, they're not in use anyway. So it brings the cost of the standing armies down. And, um, and then, yeah, we might get little improvements like that every so often. So there we go. Well done. I mean, it's a shame it was Hakon who is a bit injured. But Joe, never mind. Joe, beggars can't be choosers. It's an improvement and that's a good thing. Oh, and our marshal has been busy. Okay, so he's been showing off a promising new recruit. He may not be of the same noble stock as you, my liege, but on the name, I swear that Brthnoth. Okay, have we already seen a Brthnoth? Were you not the person that wrote our... Did you not write our poem thing? It, it must be a similar name. Um, would want on our side. Okay, let's have a look. Oh my goodness me. Yes, you've got a marshal of 22. You're quick. You're reckless, so as a commander, you're quite reckless. But okay, that's fine. You're a brilliant strategist. You're wrathful, which does give you more martial skill and a bit of dread. You're honest. Okay, that's good. And you are lustful. Oh my goodness me. So a lusty kind of military chap um, who's also very, very quick. Okay, yeah. Do you know what? Absolutely. You come in. Let's put you into our court. Because, yeah, he does seem quite good. He's not got much in the way of prowess, but we could always put him as a military leader. So, yes, absolutely good job, Marshal. And I think I just saw there that we got ourselves some extra taxes. So let's go to uh, let's go to Shrewsbury over here. And let's pop down and construct some farms and fields. Because we've got plenty of money to do that. So, yes, absolutely. Let's do that over there. And also, what about over here in Hurstingstone? Let's get, let's get farms and fields done over here. Oh, Oh, we can't do farms and fields over here because it's, uh, is it wetlands over there? I think it's wetlands. Hang on a minute. Can we, can we find that out? Oh, uh, no. Terrain is forest. Okay. Yeah, so we can't, oh, no. Terrain is wetlands where Hurstingstone is. Okay. So what can we get here that gives us a bit of money? Well, wetland farms gives us plus 0.3 a month, but walls. Walls and towers. Bastions and curtain walls are always quite useful because that gives us a bit of a level of a fort, it gives us a bit more garrison, and it does pay a little bit of money. So it gives us money and also defense as well. So yeah, why not? Let's construct some walls and towers. I mean, we're getting all this money. We might as well put it back into the economy, so it's like generating more money and all that kind of stuff. And tea has come of age. Oh, this is exciting. I'm proud to see my son no longer as a child, but as an adult. With sufficient tutelage, even a child that has displayed little natural inclination toward a scholarship, such as tea, can come to truly understand any subject. An avid learner, he has become quite the purveyor of knowledge and has proven himself fully capable of structuring advanced theoretical and theological arguments. You've got astute intellectual. Oh, you've got the third tier. Oh, that's very good. So you get learning plus six. Okay, hang on then. Hang on. Let's go and look at tea. So what are your final stats, T? Oh, they're not brilliant. They're not brilliant, are they? So, diplomacy of four, which is terrible. And we've got a marshal of three, which is terrible. We've got a stewardship of three, which is terrible. And we've got an intrigue of two, which is, yep, you guessed it, terrible. However, we do have a learning of 10, which is average. That's the best we can say about you. You're average at learning. 
Ah, dear me. Okay, never mind, never mind. That's what we've got. Now, a few people, a few people have said that we should, like, you know, sort of, you know, get rid of T. They've said, oh, we can boot him out and make him not part of the line of succession or whatever, because Bernard is going to be significantly better. I mean, already, what, Bernard's nine, and he's looking like he's going to be better than T, who is, yeah, seven years his sort of senior. So, um, so yeah, it doesn't look good, does it? It doesn't look good, but I don't think we can boot T out. I think that's mean. I just think that's a nasty thing to do. We will play as T. That's what we've been given. That's exactly what we've been given. We will play as T. We will see what happens. I mean, for all we know, T might get murdered. T might get killed at some point. He might go into battle. He might die. He might get assassinated. So I don't just want to just go, right, now. Nah, just put him out of the way because I'm, you know, min-maxing to get the best character. I don't really want to do that. I think we should play as T and just see what happens. Because he could be interesting. You know, he's a learned sort of person. We'll have the nice sort of learning tree of skills and stuff. So, um, so yeah, we'll see what happens with T. We're not just going to, we're not just going to chuck you out, T. Don't you worry. And a faction has been created against Duke Glowithian and it's Lord Rhys. Lord Rhys has created the faction to install Lord Rhys, okay, so himself of Gwent, on the Dehubar throne against Duke Glowithian. Oh, so he has said, I think I belong on there. I need to be a duke. I want to be the duke of Dehubarth, please. Uh, where is it? Factions. Against our liege. Okay, he wants the duchy of Dehubarth. Now, it's intriguing that that's happened. I was going to do it a bit later on, but if he's doing it now, we might as well strike whilst the iron is hot. Why don't we create our own claimant faction? Because what you can do is, you can do this, and you can say, we want the duchy of Mercia, please. We're going to go to our liege, and basically put an ultimatum to him and say, right, I want the Duchy of Mercia, please. We think this should be ours. Either you hand it over or there's a bit of a war. Uh, so let's do this, shall we? Let's actually start ourselves a claimant faction on the Duchy of Mercia. Because, you know, I mean, we own most of it. We've looked after it for ages. We've spent a lot of money on improving Mercia. We've built castles and fields and all sorts of bits and bobs all over the place. So, yo, I feel like now we should actually have this under our own control. Not you. You're probably you know, you're probably brilliant. You're seven years old. It's great that you're you know doing well for yourself. But this should be ours, shouldn't it? By rights, this should now be ours. So let's do this, shall we? So we'll create this as us, and there we go. We pop in. So yeah, we're going to copy this guy. We're just going to jump in straight onto this guy's sort of uh, back and say, right, okay, you're doing that. We'll do that at the same time. He's going to struggle against two people fighting him. So um, so yeah. Now what happens is we can leave it. So we can issue an ultimatum in twenty four months. And then we, yeah, we, we gather people, we gather support, people join us who sort of agree with our cause. And then eventually we pass this ultimatum over to, to our, uh, our liege there and say, right, okay, what's your choice? And if it works, we get control, no war, no bloodshed. If he says no, and he tells us to you know, clear off, then we have to go and have a big fight. But all the people that are on our side join in the fight as well. So let's see if anybody joins us. Already somebody's joined us. So Athelwolf, Wolf Stanson of Derby. Oh, there's multiple people. East Riding has joined. <gasps> oh my goodness me. Loads of people are joining us. Oh, 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 this is absolutely, this is wonderful. We've got eight members. We have eight members. And now we can send an ultimatum in seven months. Oh my goodness. Okay, right. We can unlock a new perk for diplomacy. Okie dokie. And oh yeah, T isn't married. We'll sort that out in a bit. We'll sort out in a bit. Okay. What do we want to get here now? So, I mean, we've got, I think we've got the best stuff out of the diplomacy tree. I like all the stuff down here, the uh, sort of the August, or how you pronounce it, August, um, sort of stuff is really good. Oh, can we do an epic soon as well? It must be almost time to do another epic, yay. Um, Life of Glory is really good. That's very, very helpful. All these things are brilliant. Not so bothered about Dignitas. Don't really care. Diplomacy per level of fame. Not really bothered. I think we've got one for a fame of two. So it give us some extra diplomacy. Not bothered. And that one there as well. The sort of the skill of August. Um, diplomacy plus two. Martial plus one. Prestige one per month is nice. But, you know, there's probably better things. I think we take this. Let's take groom to rule. Because I think it, it's all children uh, as in that are born now and will be born in the future. It's not just ones that are going to be born soon or going to be born from now on. This affects all of our kids. So our children will receive one to three extra skill points, which could be very useful indeed. So let's take this. So we'll unlock that, please. And now I think we're kind of done 
for the diplomacy tree. I think we're done for all of the diplomacy stuff. So yeah, I don't, I'm not really bothered about sort of close family opinion being sort of, you know, getting more sort of opinion from those guys. Thicker than water, personal scheme success against family members. When are we ever going to do that really? Um, so, I mean, each friend relation gives you two random skill points. That could be useful, but you have to go all the way down this tree. It's a lot of perks to spend to get to that point. So yeah, these are, they're quite nice to have, but you have to go through all these sort of fairly sort of naff ones first. So I think we change over to something else because we can always change. We get a boost to our diplomacy experience, but we can have any of these that we like. So we could go for a martial focus, get ourselves some dread or get ourselves some prowess and attraction opinion. We can get ourselves a permanent advantage in every battle we fight just because we're chivalrous. Or we could go down on a stewardship focus, get a load of money. I'm very tempted by the income plus 10 because that will give us absolutely loads of cash. Or go down uh, an intrigue sort of route, which I think would be bad for us because we've got bad skill in it. Or we could go down a learning route. And yeah, there's things over here where the clergy like you and you can learn about yourself and you, know, you can have sort of anatomical studies. There's one thing where it keeps you... Um, where is it? There's a thing that keeps you alive a bit longer as well. Which one's that one? That one there, know thyself. When death of natural causes is one year away, you will receive a warning. So death just kind of comes along and knocks on your door. You open it and he just goes, hello, I'll be here in a year's time. You're going to be dead in a bit. And you go, oh, okay, thank you. Bye-bye now. I mean, that's a little bit disturbing, isn't it? So, I mean, that could be quite useful. But again, we're not the best at that. We're not terrible. We're not terrible at learning. I think maybe we go down stewardship. We've got a good stewardship value, I mean, mostly because of our wife who's brilliant at it. So do we go down wealth focus? Do we get stewardship up by three? Or do we get duty focus? I'm not so bothered about that. That's to do with you know, enemy agent acceptance and courtiers opinions and stuff. We're already pretty good at that. So do we go just go for straight income and just get big piles of money to spend on, on improvements around the lands? Or do we just get stewardship up by three? which does affect tax, but I don't know if it'll affect it as much as 10%. Let's go over, let's get a wealth focus, shall we? So monthly income is going to be up by 10%. So what do we earn currently? 14 and a half. So we could flick over to that, go to wealth focus. Yes, please. And now we get 15.8. So that's actually quite a nice chunk of extra gold. And Christina Cupboard has increased her learning by two. Okay, yep, she's pretty good. I mean, yo, given that she's, what, four years old, she's quite good at the learning. And Clara Cupboard got her stewardship up by three. Her stewardship is six. Uh, Bernard increases intrigue by one. He's very, very good at that. And T increases learning by three. Oh, okay. It doesn't like that's actually kicked in. There we go. Oh, that's, okay, 13. It could be significantly worse. I mean, it could be loads better, but okay, well, there we go. So that thing was worth doing. And now we're earning a little bit more money as well. Okay, we need to keep our eye on this. We need to keep our eye on the faction to install us onto the Mercian throne. What is going to happen with this? I do not know. So in seven months, we can issue an ultimatum to say, right, what's your choice? Are you going to give up the, uh, the good old uh, Duchy of Mercia to us? Or shall we have a bit of a rumble? Let us find out. Now, this is interesting. Duke Gluithian is not very fond of us because, yes, he knows that we're sort of uh, plotting against him, I imagine. Oh, no, that's not part of the thing. That's not part of why he doesn't like us. So we're a foreign culture because, yes, he is Welsh and we are Anglo-Saxon ourselves. And uh, he doesn't like us because we're deceitful. But then that's kind of counteracted by the fact that we're forgiving. So, you know, with one hand we take, with the other hand we give kind of thing. Um, and then the thing that's actually pushed it under sort of under zero, made it into a negative opinion, is the fact that we declined guardianship. Because yes, he did try to get T to be uh, looked after by one of his people, and we said, no, go away. Okay, however, I kind of noticed that he is intimidated by our dreadful reputation. Fearing you, he is less likely to oppose you directly. Does that mean that he's less likely to say no to our claim on the Mercian throne? I do not know, but this is very interesting. And if we do get the Mercian throne... I mean, I'm expecting a fight. I'm expecting a war to come out of this. But if there is no battle, if there is no war and he hands it over, maybe we could then go up here and take that back as well. Because that is ours. We've had that claim up here on the um, the duchy of, uh, well, Brineck, isn't it, up there? On that duchy for absolutely ages. We've had that claim for quite a long time. In fact, since the start of the game, haven't we? Since when we were 16 years old. So maybe if he gives that one up, we could then have a go at this one. I am expecting a war. I'm expecting a battle. So we'll have to see. Um, also, would it help if he actually had 
a higher opinion of us. Hang on, how long is it going to take for our thing to sort of settle? Oh, two months. We will not be able to sway him in two months. There is an awful lot of support for us to get onto the uh, the Mercian throne. Not so much support for Lord Rhys to get onto the uh, De Hubar throne there. I'm really sorry, Rhys. I mean, it's very noble that you've tried. Um, yeah, you're you're just yeah. You only own one place though in De Hubarth. You only own one little corner of it, whereas we own quite a lot of the lands of Mercia. Okay, fine. Well, here we go. In two months, in one month. So the discontent is rising. Now, I think we can't we compress demands earlier. I think, yeah. So the faction leader is a player, so demands can be sent in spite of discontent and faction military power thresholds. So I think, yeah, if the faction leader is an AI player, like Lord Reese there, then military power has to go past this line before he can even sort of begin to threaten them. Because we're a player, we can do whatever we like. But we do have 452% now above the sort of the faction sort of uh, military power limit. Do you know what? We've got 232 money. Let's get ourselves a new man at arms regiment. What should we get? Oh, we can afford Huskarls. Oh, they sound good. They're expensive when they're up and running. Un Unraise is only 0.3. That's not so bad per month. We could we could completely deal with that. I and mean, we were getting that from our sort of our boosting from our new lifestyle. So, okay, let's go down that route. Let's create ourselves a new Huskarls regiment just to become even more threatening. There we go. We've got ourselves some fancy Huskars. Same picture as the knight I noticed there, but that's absolutely fine. Okay, so they're slowly going to top up. Oh, a call to war. This is very badly timed. This is very, very badly timed indeed. Okay, greetings. I call on you to honour our alliance and join me in the Munster War for... Goodness me. Flath Batak, why nil that, that one there, the chappy with the beard, uh, his claim on the Earldom of Oriel. Okay, um, okay, where where are we fighting? Hang on, hang on. What's going on here? Who's fighting who? So this chap here, this chappy who is actually sort of, he's he's actually got the claim, the bearded chappy with the crazy name, he's not anybody important. He's just a courtier of Petty King Merchad, so the chappy who we've got the alliance with. He just has a claim on this particular bit of land up there, on the Earldom of Oriel, uh, which is, if I do that right, it's just there, look, so the, it's slightly light up. It's to, the, it's to the left of where we're sort of looking now. So that little bit there. So that's what this is all about. So he's trying to claim that bit of land. Okay. I mean, it seems a bit far away. I mean, okay, on decline, he does not like us very much. Does he like us a lot anyway? Oh, not really. So he loses opinion of us. If we accept, we don't have to go and fight. I suppose we don't have to go and send some troops over. I mean, you know, it's kind of, yeah, it's an internal matter. They can deal with that themselves. So how about we say, accept. Now, does that stop us having another war, however? I don't imagine so. So, okay, we'll accept that, and that's fine. Right, we've joined in a war, which we have no intention of actually going to do, which is fine, because, you know, that's what we do. We're deceitful. We're playing to the character. Okay, and various people have joined the battle. Okie dokie. Um, okay, who are you? You are Wolfstone of Herefordshire. Okay, and you have been um, you've been corresponding with the Chancellor Reeve Edmund. I must say I've come to see you in a new light. Perhaps you're even someone that one day I'll be proud to call my friend. Ah, oh, that's nice. Oh, crikey. You're 80 years old. Yeah, you might not be around too much longer. We'll say we're friends anyway. And yeah, we'll just say that happens before you pass away. And he gets 30 opinion of us. Okay, that's well worth doing. Now, can we, can we do this thing? We can send an ultimatum at any time. The discontent against that chappy is at maximum. Can we, can we get this done as well? Oh, do we want to do this? We might plunge the country into a civil war whilst also being involved in an Irish war. Oh, let's do it. Why not? Let's press demands. Here we go. The faction to install Earl Walfioff of Northamptonshire on the Mercian throne will send an ultimatum to Duke Lewithian Ap Maraduth of De Hubarth. If he accepts, all of the faction's demands will be fulfilled. If he does not accept, the faction will start a civil war against him. Are we about to plunge the country into civil war? Let us find out. What's he going to say? It is clear to me that you would see... <gasps> it's been accepted. It's been accepted. It is clear to me that you would see the realm burn before giving up this foolish venture. For the good of the realm, I must accept your demands, but know that a great injustice was done here today. This will not stand. He's accepted it. A wise decision. Hang on a minute. Pause time for a second. We've left that faction 
Are we a duke now? <gasps> we're a duke. Oh, we're a duke. And look, Mercia is ours. Mercia is ours. Oh, this is wonderful. Lots of people are getting hooks on us. Oh, is that because they joined in the fight? Well, joined in our sort of our little sort of faction thing. Is that what that means? Hang on. Why have you got why have you got a hook on us? Hang on. What's going on with all the hooky hooks? Um yeah, these are the people that joined in on the faction, aren't they? So all those people, ah, oh, they might have joined in for not entirely trying to help me out purposes. They might have joined in for their own nefarious needs because now all these people have got a hook on us. So they could all come to us and ask us to do many things, use that hook, and yes, we cannot really say no. Oh my goodness me. We have ourselves a duchy title. The Duchy of Mercia. It's our primary title. And where are we? Hang on a minute. There we go. Duke Walthy of Sueton of Mercia. Oh my goodness me. Right, hang on a minute. Can we can we change the name of the Yes, we can. We can change the name of the Duchy. Oh, absolutely. Right, yeah, let's change that. Farewell to the Duchy of Mercia and hello to the Duchy of Cupboard, the residents of which are all Cabordians. There it is. Oh, the Duchy of Cupboard is right in the middle of the country and it looks mighty glorious indeed. Okay, now this must mean, this must mean that I now have a proper vassal because I didn't have those two places before, did I? I didn't have those two places. So what's going on there? Herefordshire and Worcestershire. They must be, hang on, have I got a, have I got a vassal? It's here. Vassal limit. Yes, one out of 20. Yeah, look, Earl Wolfstan is a proper actual vassal of mine. So he's looking after those territories for me on my behalf. And we have a little contract with him like we have with our boss. Okay. Oh, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. We are finally a duke. This is splendid. Right. Okay. Do you know what? Ireland, hang on a minute then. We'll come over and help you now. We had a little bit of sort of, you know, internal administrative matters to deal with. But uh, yeah, now it's all good. We'll just pop over. Right. Hang on a minute. So what we'll do is we'll go over and, you know, do our thing for that war because they're our allies. And they've asked for our help. So we've said yes. We'll now go and meet those obligations. Um, so we'll do that next time because we will finish up for the moment because we're going to finish on a high. We're going to finish on an absolute high. Look at that. The Duchy of Cupboard, homed here in Northampton. The, the, the capital of the Duchy of Cupboard in Northampton. And it looks marvellous indeed. Look at it. Oh, we got Nottinghamshire as well. And that's ours. We've taken Nottinghamshire. So we're at our holdings limit as well. So we can't control any more counties without having a little bit of a problem with, you know, sort of levies and tax and, I don't know, sort of, you know, general sort of, general badness happening. It all gets a little bit sort of disorganised and corruption creeps in. Uh, but yeah, we do have the, uh, we've got one vassal and we can have, we can have 20. Good grief. Yeah, we can have 20 vassals. So that's brilliant. Well, there we go. Do you know what? Yeah, we'll absolutely finish on that because that is, that's what we wanted. That's what we set out to do. We are now dukes. The Dukes. The Dukes of Cupboard. <laughs> Which is brilliant. Oh, yes. We're the Dukes of Cupboard in the Duchy of Cupboard. And and there we go. We are now a proper Duke. Oh, hang on a minute. Do you know what this needs? This needs a new hat. There we go. Much better. It's a celebratory Duke hat. And so with the title of Duke to our name and a shiny new wonderful hat as well, we will wrap things up for now. But yeah, we'll come back and see how we get on over there with the Irish war that we're going to join in. And then also as well, we might go and have a little look up here. We might see if we can get another Duke title to our name as well. Because yes, we are sort of able to claim that one up there. The Duchy of Brineck could indeed belong to us at some point in the near future. But we'll do all that kind of stuff next time out. Hopefully you are still enjoying this. If you are, please do leave a like. That would be most marvellous indeed. And also, if you're not already, then please do subscribe to keep up to date with how we get on here next time out in Crusader Kings 3. But for now, thank you very much for joining me in the Geek Cupboard. And I will see you next time. This is going to end badly. This is going to end badly, I suspect. <laughs> My God, it's Pengu. So uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have to put the engine bit. I feel that might be a problem in making a car. <laughs> I've broken the windscreen. It's, end, it's ending badly. It's ending very badly indeed. I might crash into a tree. How do I do any of the stuff with this car?